Yesterday we concluded at this point, I said that in the interaction picture the evolution operator for a state is essentially this and I also told you that you don't have to worry about the time ordering because we are only going to look at uh, lowest order, lowest order it is 1 minus this quantity, 1 does not matter because it is going to be an identity operation. So essentially integral of uh, Hamiltonian, time dependent Hamiltonian between these two points is what will come. Okay, now let us do this properly. So we are thinking of a system whose Hamiltonian can be divided into three parts. I mean in the back of the mind you think of an atom at an electromagnetic field, but we will simplify everything with a scalar field and a monopole detector rather than a current JMU coupling to a vector potential MU. Okay. So there is a Hamiltonian for a field which is a scalar field and in your mind this is an electromagnetic field and that you can quantize and you have the Fock basis and there are quanta of this particle which gives you the number number of particles present etc etc. Then you have a H for the detector which you think of like the Schrodinger equation for the atom that defines for you the atom's energy level and we are going to consider a two level system. So there is an upper level and a lower level with energies E0 and E1. So this is the part which you can solve exactly this part and this part. Then you put an interaction term. So the interaction term we will take it to be of this form. This is a proxy again if you want to to think of a current J uh, dot for example a vector potential A which is what in electromagnetism will do and that is what in real life is exciting and de-exciting for example a hydrogen atom when the hydrogen atom is emitting radiation or a molecule is emitting radiation etc. So here the proxy is that instead of some dipole moment I am taking a monopole moment this is some object which comes from the detector and it is evolving along the proper time of the detector. If the detector is moving on some crazy trajectory, it is going to keep track on the proper time of the detector. Then you, it is coupled locally to the scalar field which means that only the value of the field on the trajectory of the detector is relevant. So it is completely ultra local, it is only picking up the field at that point. So, we also know that this mu of tau because of what we have done in the previous lectures, I mean in the actually in the last lecture that it is mu at 0 and its time dependence is given by this with respect to the H0 and H0 now here is just H detector. So we know how this is evolving in time left to itself before the interaction got switched on. So once you have the interaction got switched on. If you did not have an interaction this will continue to evolve like this and the field will evolve like this and they are not talking to each other. So what the interaction will do is to make the field go from some initial state i to a final state f. Now the initial states are vacuum state for the field. Okay. We are saying that the field is in the vacuum state and in the end whatever state the field ends up I do not care. I am worried about the detector clicking. So the initial to final state is some vacuum state and the final state here for the field. We will come back and look at what it is closely uh, later on, but let right now just keep it at some state psi. Then for the detector it was in the ground state, it is a two level system. It was at the ground state E0 and the final state we want it to be E1. So I want the detector to be excited. When it is moving along an accelerated trajectory or some crazy trajectory and this is what we want to compute. And we would also like detector which is sitting quietly not to get excited. Okay, on an inertial trajectory it should not get excited and that also we should cross check to calibrate the model. Okay. So let us ask what is the transition amplitude? So the amplitude for it to go from some on, uh, I to F, this is just to remind you I am doing it in the lowest order in the perturbation theory, is uh, essentially the Hamiltonian, the interaction Hamiltonian which is sitting here, this is the interaction Hamiltonian with this mu replaced by this quantity and whose expectation value I take between I and F. Now I and F are energy eigenstates, so when you act on this with this e to the minus I tau H0 and e to the I tau H0, it is going to pick up E0 and E1 which are the final state and initial state. So you are going to pick up e to the minus i e naught tau from the other end and e to the i e naught e 1 tau in this end and e 1 minus e naught is the uh, upper level energy minus lower level energy. So this is some positive quantity. So I have written it like that. Then here there is a mu of 0 which is, which is not really relevant for us 
and phi along the trajectory x of tau. So, this initial and final states we have taken as direct product states. So, there is a states for the field and states for this. So, the states for the detector just act on this or rather this detector acts on the states of the detector. So, there is some matrix element here. This is what would I have given you selection rules if you are doing an atom in electromagnetic field. So, you would ask I have a dipole moment, is there a dipole moment between some 2 s state and uh, some 1 s state or whatever and whether there is a these transitions can take place. So, I am just trying to connect it up with some things which you know in atom interacting with a electromagnetic radiation, but we do not care about it, we will just assume it is some non-zero number. Our interest is in this which has the trajectory because we are interested in different trajectories. So, there is this phi at x of tau between vacuum and some state of the field. What we want is the transition probability. So, you have to take mod square of this. So, mod square of this quantity i etcetera is just going to give you this. Then you have to take the mod square of this and this integral. So, you have two copies of this integral. First copy which goes with tau e to the minus, uh, okay, I think I have flipped the uh, tau's. So, one of them is e to the i tau prime. So, let us take this as the first copy and then there is a phi and uh, this quantity and then its complex conjugate will have a minus i eta and this quantity. Okay. So, because you have taken complex conjugate one will have a psi here, the other will have a psi here and we say that look I do not care what is happening to the state of the field. So, I am going to sum over all the size of this which is a complete set. So, once you have done that you will essentially get phi at x of tau, phi at x of tau prime vacuum expectation value multiplied by this with two integrals. So, let us pause for a moment and look at this. So, we have reduced the entire problem some proportionality constant which we do not care and there is a double integral over tau and tau prime and then there is a e to the minus i e tau minus tau prime. We know where it came from because the monopole moment was evolving in time as e to the minus i e tau and all that the field is going to contribute is this two point function. And this is not exactly the propagator which we have studied. The propagator comes with a time ordering symbol. There is no time ordering symbol here. So, this is called a Wettmann function. So, I just denote it as g plus so that you do not confuse it with g. Hopefully, I will be consistent and keep putting a g plus, but remember that this is what we are looking at. And that is going to depend on two events x and x prime which is along the trajectory of tau. So, let us let us just draw a diagram to understand that this is the trajectory of a detector. So, this is a point x where it was at some time tau and this is another point where it was at some other time tau prime and we are calculating the field correlation between these two points. Okay. Now, in general if I take some crazy trajectory here, this is going to depend on tau and tau prime individually. What we are interested in is the stationary response of the detector where nothing depends on time. If, if it does then you can compute this, then your answer is going to depend on at what time you are uh, talking about the clicking of the detector etcetera. It might click very rapidly at some time and then it will go back and not click at all etcetera. But there are times when you are going to get a stationary response. The stationary response you will get if the this quantity which you are computing here depends only on tau minus tau prime. You can easily figure out when it will happen. Suppose there is a killing vector, time like killing vector in the manifold and you take the integral curve to that killing vector. Suppose this is an integral curve to that killing vector. Then if I go along that uh, trajectory nothing changes in the geometry or in the physics, it is a symmetry. Therefore, you can only depend on tau prime minus tau. Now, we already know that the two cases which we are interested in, one when it is just going up vertically where you are choosing the standard time coordinate as the time like killing vector or we are interested in an uniformly accelerated case where the killing vector, the tangent vector to that is the boost operator because I told you that that hyperbola which you draw, finally when you looked at the Rindler metric, the Rindler metric was static. The metric was independent of tau. It was independent of tau because the guy was moving along a trajectory which is a symmetry of the space time, it is a boost symmetry of this space time. So, in both the cases we know that it is only going to depend on tau minus tau prime. 
This does not exhaust all stationary trajectories, we will come back to right at the end. So, right now let us just fix our thoughts on inertial and uniformly accelerated trajectory. In both the cases, we know that for a stationary trajectory, this is going to depend on only tau minus tau prime. Now, I have a data integration and a d tau prime integration, which I can convert into a tau minus tau prime integration and tau plus tau prime integration, just elementary this. Right? So, tau minus tau prime integration is all that is going to give you something here, but there is a tau plus tau prime integration going from minus infinity plus infinity, which is divergent. But this is again a harmless divergence, this is something which we know, this is the total probability of transition from minus infinity to plus infinity, what we would like is the rate of transition. So, either you can put a Dirac delta function and convert to rate or you can take it from some minus t to plus t and then uh, carefully divide by 1 by t and get the calculation. This is something which you guys have done in time dependent perturbation theory in quantum mechanics, this is exactly, this is the Fermi's golden rule. So, in Fermi's golden rule, this is exactly what you do to get the rate of transition. So, I omit that integration with respect to tau plus tau prime and say it is a rate. Then there is an integration with respect to tau minus tau prime. So, the g plus just depends on this difference and I have a e to the minus i that uh, difference. So, this is what we have to compute. This will tell me what is the rate of excitation between these two energy levels, ground state to the upper level. And when the detector is moving along some trajectory for which the Wittmann function just depends on this. Okay. So, what is this object? When you compute, what do you get? What you get for a massless field is essentially this. It is just the sigma square t minus t prime the whole square minus x minus x prime the whole square, but there is an i epsilon here which is crucial and uh, it is See, if I had taken that i epsilon out and I have put this i epsilon here, I would have got Feynman propagator, which is what we have studied. And that would have given me a theta of t and theta of minus t. And here you get a different kind of i epsilon. Remember our harmonic oscillator with two poles and I told you that depending on where you put the i epsilon, you may either avoid both the poles or you may avoid them from below or above or you may avoid one on the top and one at the bottom, etc. So, this is what it comes from. Since we did not do this in QFT, let me just work it through. Uh, in this section, I am using again plus minus minus minus. Whenever I do QFT, I take formulas from my book and that means the signature is this. So, what is this going to be? That is very easy because first of all, there are two of them. So, there is a square root of 2 omega that is going to give me this omega 2 I have put here and your standard 1 over 2 pi cube. And uh, essentially, you have one phi acting on vacuum, another phi acting on vacuum. So, that will just give you u to the minus i k x minus x prime. So, which if you expand it out, it is e to the minus omega k t minus t prime. It is a massless field. So, omega k is just modulus of k. Then e to the i k dot x minus x prime. So, you this is trivial integral. So, what you have is when you are doing this integral, you have the magnitude of k which is omega k and there is a k square d k, k square and this k will give you a k, it is a k d k, it is d omega k omega k and omega k is just magnitude of k. Then you have e to the minus i omega t minus t prime. Then you have an integration on this, it is e to the i k this cosine of theta. So, that is written down here and you have a 2 pi sin theta d theta. Okay. So, this integral you can immediately do and you will get a sin divided by this, I am sure you probably know that. So, if you look at this integral, you find that everything is okay except at upper limit and upper limit you want convergence. So, you put a minus i epsilon. This is how this minus i epsilon comes in. So, minus and minus gives you a plus, i into i gives you a minus. So, it it uh, it is nicely damped down at this point. Then you do this integral. I mean the, the standard way is you write this as e to the i k minus e to the minus i k. Then you do both the integrals and you will get two denominators. You combine them together as quadratic. And then in the top, it is like a 1 upon a, a minus b and 1 upon a plus b. There will be an a square minus b square and then a plus b and a minus b will give you a 2a. And in this particular case, that 2a happens to be exactly this x minus x prime that will get cancelled out. So, all that you get is one quantity square minus the other quantity square inverse. Okay? So, this is what it goes, this is how it goes. So, you know what this quantity is. Uh, what we need to do is to evaluate it on the trajectory. Remember, this is x at tau and x prime at tau 
top rank. So, when you do that, you take your trajectory just for simplicity, you set constants in such a way that it is moving along x is equal to 1 over kappa cos h of kappa tau and t is equal to 1 over kappa sin h of kappa tau. Then what you will get in the denominator that sigma square will become sin h square. And that is also actually easy to see. See, you have essentially t square minus x square kind of a thing which you are converting into this t, t1 minus t2 the whole square minus x1 minus x2 the whole square. So, this is the distance think Euclidean, but then it becomes a circle, your sin h and cos h becomes sin theta and cos theta, if you are at two different points, you are just calculating the distance between them. So, if this vector is r 1, this vector is r 2, you are just calculating r 1 square plus r 2 square minus 2 r 1 r 2 at constant r. So, that gives you 2 r square minus 2 r square times cosine of theta, that is 2 r square into 1 minus cosine of theta that will become a sin square theta by 2 and when you go back to hyperbolic terms, you will get sin h square. So, I am just trying to show you that it is nothing mysterious, it is just a distance between two points in the Euclidean plane analytically continued back. Okay? Of course, you can work with uh, hyperbolic sin and hyperbolic cos and you will get the same result. So, finally, we have the answer that the rate of transition is given by this integral. All that we have to do is to evaluate this then we know the rate at which the detector is going to make the transition. So, let us first do a calibration, what happens when kappa is equal to 0. So, then uh, this sin h square when kappa this goes to 0 is just square of this quantity and this will cancel with this and you will get the square of this. So, if you do the inertial limit, you are going to pick up this. Now, remember that E is positive. So, I have a I am integrating along s, this is real s and this is imaginary s. I am integrating along that real s and because E is positive, I have to close the contour at lower half. So, when I, when your s becomes minus i, yes, uh, i times z or something like that, minus and minus will cancel, i into i will give you a damping term, E is positive, everything is fine. But the pole is sitting at s is equal to i epsilon. This is why i epsilons are sometimes very important. So, you get a nice 0, at least for e greater than 0, right, which is what we thought of because we said that there are two levels. Actually, we never said e is positive, we just kept e and we said it is e 1 minus e 2. In case e was negative, you will get a contribution from that pole. So, essentially, the rate is proportional to theta of minus e. So, what does it mean? What it means is that if you kept the object in the ground state and there is another energy with a, another energy level with an energy gap, positive energy gap and the detector is uh, not moving, it is in an inertial trajectory, then nothing will happen. It will not get excited. Very good, very gratifying. Now, what happens if it is moving with uniform velocity? You do not have to do any calculation because it is the Wittmann function which we computed. You can do it in another Lorentz frame, quantum field theory is Lorentz invariant, so you will get the same result. If the E was flipped sign, E is negative, that is if you started with a detector at an upper level, of course, it will decay and there is a decay probability for that. You can compute and plug in all the coefficients, etcetera. So, at some other case, I have worked all of them out and I will just show you, but this is just for curiosity. You do not need anything, but it is fine. So, the vacuum is stable and uh, nothing is going to happen to the vacuum if you have an inertial detector. Then. Now, let us do the real case which is this integral. We want to do this integral. So, you clean up a little bit, you kappa by 2 s, yes, you change into some other variable. So, you will pick up a factor 2 here and you call that constant here as some omega. So, essentially you have to do this contour integral. So, there is a sin h square of x minus i epsilon and a e to the minus i omega x, this integral you have to do. So, again do exactly the same thing, you are going to do this and close here, but now you are going to have poles because sin h is going to have poles at x is equal to minus i pi n and each one of them is a second order pole. So, go back to your mathematical methods 101. If you want a residue at a second order pole, you multiply by that quadratic object to the whole function to kill it and then take one derivative. Second order pole, you take one derivative. So, this is the quantity you want to calculate in the limit when the x is going to minus i pi n, which is where you want the limit. So, 
uh, change variable from x plus i pi n, this whole thing you call z, then you go and plug that here. So, this will become e to the 2 i z and then this i pi n, this together will give you this factor. Okay, that is independent of z. Then this x is going to become z minus i pi n. Now, there is just one point which I want to stress because it is going to be important later. So, compute this quantity, it is sin h of z minus i pi n. So, sin h will be sin h and a cos h and a cos h and a sin h. So, when you take sin h of i pi n, it is going to be sin pi n, that second term just disappears. So, in the first term, you have a sin h of z, which is fine, which is going to survive. Then you have a cos h of i pi n, which become cos of pi n cos of pi n is minus 1 to the power n, but there is a square here. So, it is minus 1 to the power 2 n. So, you do not have to take that into account and you end up getting this sin h square. The rest is straightforward. So, you have some limit z going to 0 of this particular function and then there is a sum. This sum is very nice. It is our old friend. It is a geometric series and you work that out and you will find that uh, that sum is going to give you this sum is going to give you this factor and this is coming from that derivative in front. You compute that and you will just get e over 2 pi. So, you get a very nice Planck spectrum. Yeah. No, this i epsilon was just to tell you, oh, you mean the other i epsilon. No, that does not contribute. n is equal to 0 does not contribute. Yeah, that is right. For the same reason as this, it goes up. Yeah. Okay. So, you end up this sum, this sum is going to give you a nice Planck spectrum. I mean, it is n is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus this quantity, you multiply by that. So, it becomes e to the 2 pi e upon kappa minus 1. So, you can you can complete the rest of the argument. So, what does it tell you? So, this was first done by Bill Andrew in a much more complicated way. This particular derivation is due to, I think, Bryce David. And it first appeared in an Einstein Centenary Symposium in 1979. So, these kind of detectors are called Andrew David detectors. Okay. So, this detector detects a Planck spectrum. So, we have this following conclusion that if I take a detector and I put it in this accelerated trajectory, it is going to click. And it is going to click as though the detector is immersed inside a bath. It is not moving, but it is in, in, immersed inside a bath and in that bath is at a some temperature t. We will come back to this. There are a few comments which one has to make or, or maybe I can do it now. Let me see. Ah, right. Okay. So, let me finish off all the comments there. So, the first point is that uh, the rate at which this transition is taking place is sort of universal. This, this was mentioned even very early on in the class. The detector is moving along some direction. But it is not seeing a Planck spectrum. It is not like CMBR. It is not getting more photons hitting in front and less photons from the back. It is isotropic. There is no direction dependence here. It just went away. So, it is behaving as though it is immersed in an isotropic uh, uh, bath. What is more, this rate of detection which we are computing is for this kind of an eternal trajectory because we integrated from minus infinity plus infinity. And one can ask what is going to happen if I stop the detector, start the detector, etc. So, people have done all that because, so for example, you can have a detector which is open only from minus t to plus t and then you the trajectory changes and then you can compute what it is going to be. There will be corrections. You can calculate the corrections. You can say that it is sort of approximately thermal in some cases, etc., etc. So, all these computations can be worked out for this. The rate at which it is detecting is telling you that it is, if you started out with a ground state, it is going to end up at a higher state and at some stage you could tap that and make it go down and emit that energy and then make it do useful work. <coughs> so, that means somebody has supplied this energy and the source of the energy as I told you is the guy who is pushing it. And there is at least one paper which I, many people have worked out it, I am most familiar with my own work, there is a 1984 paper which is titled why does the accelerator detector click where I did the nitty gritty of the mechanism of the detection and then you can convince yourself that the guy who is pushing part of the energy is going into exciting the internal modes and the other part is going out as an emission. Emission, where is the emission? To see the emission, you have to go back a little bit and ask what was this state psi? 
for the field. See, this is what we did, but if you go one step even earlier, you are getting this matrix element. Now, phi is a quantum field, so it has a A and an A dagger. The A acting on the vacuum will just kill it. So, there is an A dagger which acts on the vacuum that will give you an one particle state. So, this is going to be an one particle state with some momentum. So, when we are summing over all that, you are just saying that I do not care which way that particle went. It has some vector k and all that, I do not care about that particle. And energy conservation will ensure that it will should have a particular energy corresponding to that k and all that sort of thing. But the final state of the field is a one particle state. You started the field in an initial state which is vacuum and the detector at a state which was ground state. At very late times, when you are going home with the detector, you find the detector has gone into the excited state, but there is a field quanta milling around. So, the inertial observer is going to interpret this whole phenomena that somebody was pushing the detector, he supplied enough energy to kick the detector from ground state to an excited state and he also gave some energy to for it to emit. So, what is thought of as a detection in the Rindler frame, the guy who is riding along with the detector will be thought of as an emission in the other frame. In the early days, this created enormous amount of confusion, but it has all been sorted out and people have done all kinds of thought experiments, worked out all the limits, etc. And there are no real paradoxes in it. Every, every once in a while, somebody will come up with that, but if you look at it closely, you will find that it is all resolved. So, there is no issue here. The reason I am not a great fan of this detector, I am going to describe to you now. The detector when this technology got developed, uh, some people went as much as to say that particles are what particle detectors detect. Okay? So, there is no invariant notion of a detector, a particle and you have to come up with an operational definition. I would still like to maintain that particles are the excitations of an underlying quantum field. I think that is the proper way to think about it. Because the detector may not give you exactly the result which quantum field theory gives in several cases. Now, I want to show you a classic case which has not been emphasized as much as it should be. This result exists in various places. The best place to read it up is a review article by Takagi, uh, T A K A G I, uh, Japanese researcher, and this is a very famous review, and in that he has worked out everything in detail. And I am just simplifying it uh, in a particular manner so that you can compare it with the case which I have already discussed. So, as I said, it is a caution. Let us look at a d plus 1 dimensional case. That is, instead of 3 plus 1, suppose I am in a d dimensional space and I am doing exactly the same. The detector is still moving along one dimension. There is an x and a t, and detector is moving along that trajectory. All other transverse dimensions are going for a ride. And we are so habituated in the course of these lectures to say, oh, transverse dimension do not matter. Even when it is compact, theta, pi, you just ignore the transverse dimension, just concentrate on rt. So, I will tell you where it comes and hits you. So, let us do that. So, if you do that, you can compute the Wittmann function again. I will not go through the details, but essentially you will again get this with various d dependent factors, but it is going to go as some minus d minus 1 by 2. So, when d is equal to 3, you can do a check, 3 minus 1 is 2, 2 by 2 goes away, it is just minus 1. And uh, if you look at it along the inertial trajectory, yes, you again get S minus I epsilon under D minus 1, D is equal to 3, it gives you a square. So, let us first take care of the transition rate integral for the inertial detector and let us just make that the d dimension is not going to screw it up. This is because if we will very soon see that it is going to screw things up for an accelerated detector. So, you want to first calibrate for an inertial detector. And everything is fine there. There is an x minus i epsilon times d minus 1 and e to the minus i omega i x. Now, if you want to do this rigorously, then you have to take the, uh, you know, take the pole and take the limit and all that. But essentially, you can immediately guess there is going to be a theta of minus omega. That is coming because of the pole structure. Pole is sitting in one direction and you are closing the contour like this. So, unless omega is negative, it is not going to come through. And this is where I said that I will tell you what the constants are. So, this is theta of minus omega. If you are at d is equal to 3, there is a gamma of 3 by 2 and then there is an omega to the power uh, 3 minus 2 which is modulus of omega and the factor. So, this is the exact result in case you want it. Previously, I just said it is proportional to theta of minus omega. 
So fine, at least the vacuum is still stable even in d plus 1 dimension. Now you go and compute the accelerated trajectory. So exactly the same kind of an integral will emerge. So we originally had sin h square, but you get now sin h d minus 1. So this d is uh, 3, it will give you sin h square. So you would have said yes, I mean it is a pain in the neck because it is a d minus 1 order pole, but uh, you, we know how to do that and we might as well get along with it. When you get along with it, something interesting happens. So you have this, so you, you take the poles at x plus i pi and you multiply by this quantity just like the previous calculation, then you go and do the derivative d minus 2 times because it is uh, d minus 1 order pole. You shift it, you get an z to the d minus 1, this and you get everything. Here is where it hits you. You are now computing sin h of z minus i pi n which we did even previously. So the, there will be a sin and cos term which is going to come up. So you get a sin h of z and you get a cos of i pi cos of i pi is still minus 1 to the power n, but now you take minus 1 to the power n to d minus 1. Previously it was 2, so it was minus 1 square to the power n, this went away. But you now you pick this up right inside this summation. So this is all there is to it, this elementary thing completely changes the complexion. You can sum it up, when you sum it up, you get a prefactor that you can live with, but you get e to the 2 pi omega, well I have put kappa equals 1 for this calculation because it was more complicated. So it is t pi 2 pi omega by kappa or think of omega as a scale this thing, but you get a minus 1 to the power d. So if d is 3, fine, you get minus 1 Planck spectrum and people do 1 plus 1 dimension, very good, you get Planck spectrum. You try to do it in any other dimension, you end up getting a Fermi spectrum, I mean fermion-like spectrum, the sign flips. But if you do quantum field theory in d dimension, you still get the correct result, correct result meaning you always get the Planck spectrum. So you find that this result is not going to match with what you get from quantum field theory in general. You pick up an extra factor and uh, just for completeness, I told you what it gets multiplied by, there is this factor which you run into your Mathematica and it will tell you what is q3, q4, I mean in 3 dimension, in 4 dimension, 5 dimensions, etc. And the final answer is this in d dimension times this quantity with these factors. So this is the spoil sport and it tells you that this nice, um, you know, Planckian spectrum which we have been getting is in some sense a bit of an accident, I mean not quite an accident. Nobody knows a simple reason to explain why it is, I mean, same rule applies in the entire course. Without doing the calculation, you could not have told me that if I am doing it in even dimension and odd dimension, this will come flipping, okay. But of course, once you do the calculation, it is very obvious where it comes from. I mean, in fact, I wrote it in such a way that it will be obvious to you. I mean, Takagi's review does not do it like this, he does it in a more complicated way. So here is exactly where the other factor comes in. And that also tells you why it does not happen in the other cases and this is n d minus 1 which is what is giving you the extra fact, okay. There are a few more cautionary remarks which I want to make about it. This is not the only reason you want to distrust what detects that detects. What detects it detects is a nice thing, but it is, uh, it is one facet of the uh, field theory. And whether you want to just use that and say that particles are defined by what particle detectors detect, I have my doubts. So the first point is let us come back to this. If you put on some crazy trajectory, then the detector response will be time dependent. But we want a stationary response that is something which is independent of time. So for that, you have to put it on a killing vector field. Now, we are, we are doing everything in flat space time. So in flat space time, there are 10 killing vectors corresponding to uh, rotations and Lorentz boost and translations. There are three rotations, three dimensional rotations and three Lorentz boosts along x, y and z. So that makes it six and then four translational symmetries. We can move from move all the four coordinates. So this is the Poincare group symmetry. So there are 10 killing vectors corresponding to that. You can write down the killing vector for each one of them and the flat space time will not change if you do any one of them. 
So, you can now take a linear combination of killing vectors, linear combinations of killing vectors will also be a killing vector, it is a very elementary result in GR. So, you take a linear combination of these vectors and then you arrange it in such a way that it is time like, at least in some region, even Rindler trajectory we know is time like only in this part of it, I mean if you go to F, it is not a time like curve, okay. So, you take that curve and you put a detector on it. Now, pretty weird uh, motions can be created by this. Remember now we can go off the x t plane, because you can take a boost along y direction, a rotation along z direction and another boost along z, z, the third direction. So, if you take the killing vector corresponding that, sure you have a integral curve which is sort of twists around and uh, if you put a detector on that and it is moving in a crazy trajectory, it will still maintain stationarity. So, there are completely weird kind of trajectories in which the net response is going to be a independent of time and you can define the rate of transitions. Now, once you have got this kind of a transformation, you can go to the rest frame and use this as a time coordinate. That is, you can go to, you take this trajectory and then, so this is exactly what I said and you can set up a coordinate system with tau as the time coordinate and then you can define your spatial coordinate and you can go and do quantum field theory there. You can do quantum field theory because you can separate it as e to the minus i omega tau, because it is stationary, so you have a e to the minus i omega tau, you have positive and negative frequencies with respect to this time coordinate. And then you can compare it with your original flat space time, Bogolibo coefficient. Of course, your mode functions will be fairly complicated, but you can compute that. So, people have done that, at least for a bunch of simple trajectories, people have worked this out. And what happens is that there are doable cases. And there are a few cases where that one integral can be done. I mean, you just want the right rate at which the detector is clicking, which is just one integration. That integration can be done numerically and you have results. And what you find is that there are several cases where the quantum field theory will tell you that the Bogolibo coefficients are 0, but the detector will click. In the case of a uniformly accelerated frame, we found that what you found was the thermal spectrum. If you have done quantum field theory comparison, the mode beta square is also a thermal spectrum. And this is what led to this notion that, oh, detectors are detecting those betas. No, they are not detecting those betas. This is a coincidence. The simplest example of this, which again created confusion in the initial days, is a rotating detector. If you take a rotating detector, you can compute its rate of transition, you get a, you get a function. It is nothing thermal, I mean there is no temperature which you can attribute to it. But if you do quantum field theory, you will find that the vacuum states are the same. There are some issues about boundary conditions there, but if you do it correctly, you can convince yourself that the, uh, the vacuum states are the same and the betas are uh, 0, but the detector will click. Similarly, there is another motion which is called some cusp motion in the literature and that motion, the trajectory does have a cusp. And you can compute everything exactly there, you can do the quantum field theory, you will find that the Bogolibo coefficients vanish, but the detector will click. So, the, what the detector is actually doing is to measure the vacuum fluctuations. So, it is phi at tau, phi at tau prime vacuum vacuum sandwich whose Fourier transform we are computing, that is all we are doing. So, phi at tau, phi at tau prime the vacuum sandwich is what you would have thought is the correlation function in the vacuum which describes how the field is fluctuating in the vacuum and if you take a Fourier transform of that, the correlation functions Fourier transform is a power spectrum. Actually, it is very, very similar to the very first calculation we did, taking a complex plane wave and computing its power spectrum. That is all which we are essentially doing. I mean, you know, of course, it is given lot more meaning in terms of this if Fourier transform is coming because the detector monopole moment is varying in a particular way, etc., etc. But this is essentially what is being done here. So, you find that this is more like a fluctuometer rather than uh, in whether you want to call it actually a particle detector. So, this is something which you need to be careful about. Now, this issue also has been resolved. The we do not have actually time to go into that, but I, let me just mention it to you in two cases. What happens is that in when you do quantum field theory, there is a no, two different notions which come out. 
One is the notion of positive frequency, which is what we have been using all along, which essentially tells you i d by d t acting on the mode function should give you a positive eigenvalue. So, if you have e to the minus i omega t, you call it a positive frequency mode. There is something else in quantum field theory called positive norm. Because the scalar field equation comes with a, the Klein Gordon equation for the scalar field comes with a conserved norm for that, and you can write down that norm. And this norm can be used to decompose the mode functions into positive norm and negative norm. Usually, at least in flat space time inertial coordinate, the positive norm will agree with positive frequency, but in general, they will not. For example, if you are working with a metric in which there is a cross term between time and space. A rotating metric, if you if you take uh, x is equal to some a cos omega t kind of a transformation and if you go into a rotating frame, you will pick up a d omega d t cross term and there are other cases where you will maybe might pick up a d or d t kind of a cross term. When there is a cross term, when you calculate the uh, norm correctly using the covariant derivatives, you will find that what is positive norm and what is positive frequency will not match. As a result of which, to be very, very rigorous, you should define your particle eigenstate in terms of positive norm mode function rather than positive frequency mode function. So, in all the cases which I have talked about where there was no off diagonal terms, etcetera, these two things did not did coincide. So, as a result of which, I did not caution you about. But this is the time to tell you about that and these things in general will not match. In a rotating frame, it does not match. And one has worked it out and one knows exactly where that extra con contribution is coming from. All that you have to do, essentially the maths is quite trivial and you will, you will find that thing discussed in this paper for example, it is a review article. If you take the two point function, the Whitman function, you can go and rewrite it in terms of a's and a daggers using the Bogolubo coefficient. So, there are alphas and betas milling around and you can compute that whole thing. And when you do that, you will find that all these terms, there is an alpha, alpha, beta, beta and an alpha, beta and a beta alpha, all these terms are going to give you a contribution with Dirac delta functions. That Dirac delta functions will have things like omega 1 plus omega 2 kind of a stuff. And if positive frequency and positive norm coincides, all of them will go away and only one of them will uh, remain and that will be proportional to mode beta square. You can actually prove that. If not, there is a mix up because of which you will you will be able to pick up some extra bits from it and that is what happens. So, there is another case which uh, unfortunately, I do not have time to discuss which is a result known as Schwinger effect. This has nothing to do with gravity, but it is a very beautiful result in uh, uh, in quantum field theory, which essentially says that if you have a con constant electric field in a particular space time region, you assume it is all over, but later on you put boundaries. So, if you have a constant electric field, then the vacuum becomes unstable and you will create particle pairs, either complex uh, charged bosons or it can create charged fermions, etcetera from the vacuum. Now, this is very easy to understand if you write down the electric field. See, the electric field in our standard electrodynamics, ok, I should use another color. So, the electric field is given by minus gradient of the scalar potential minus d a by d t. So, if you have a constant electric field, I can represent the gauge by saying phi is 0 and a is linear in time. Then if you write down your equations etcetera, your problem will become time dependent, but there is no spatial dependent. So, you can take away the spatial dependence by Fourier transforming, then you will essentially get a time dependent harmonic oscillator. And from that, if you start with the e to the minus i omega t kind of oscillator, at very late times it will be a linear combination of e to the minus i omega t and e to the plus i omega t and you can pick up the beta function, the Bogolubo coefficient, the betas and from that you can compute this result. So, you do that and you are very happy and you know what is the amount of particles which are being produced and all that. Then your friend comes and says he does not like this gauge and he would like to keep this 0 and he wants to keep phi as some minus e naught x. Okay. 
So the moment you do that, your electric field is going to come from this. And when you go back and try to do the calculation, there is no time dependence in the problem. So you can now do e to the minus i omega t. And if that is the whole story, then that e to the minus i omega t is going to stay as e to the minus i omega t. Something else is going to happen to spatial parts, but we do not care. So as a result of which you might end up concluding there is no particle production. Now, the particle, whether there is a particle production or not in Schwinger effect cannot depend on gauge. And in fact, this is, this is, uh, this whole thing was worked out by Schwinger in a paper whose title was on the gauge invariance of quantum electrodynamics, okay. So that does not happen. And what happens, what saves you is that you can read about it in this. What saves you is that when you do this, you have to be very, very careful because positive norm and positive frequency will not match. So you have to go and say what is your particle very correctly by using positive norms and when you do that and you rework the whole thing, you find that the correct results are applied. So this is not a trivial thing and uh, you can also ask in these cases what detectors do and you will read all about it in this, okay. So one can work these things out. But because of these reasons as well as this uh, very nice formula with a minus 1 to the power d, I am not a great fan of detectors alone being used to define particles. It is one, it captures one facet of the quantum field theory and quantum field theory is very rich. So if you, there are other facets of quantum field theory which you can capture by other techniques like thinking of it as excitations of relativistic field. Now having said all this, I should also add, I mean if you are really interested in this, some very recent work done by a group led by a person called Stephen Fulling. He, Stephen Fulling is the first guy who pointed out that there are inequal and quantization in uh, flat space time between Rindler and uh, the Minkowski space. So he has been, uh, okay, the, just to, I am oversimplifying it a little bit, but essentially the idea is that this monopole mu of tau coupling to a field phi of x of tau is not the only way in which you can detect particles. So even if you want to do particle detection and you want a detector, this is not the only model. And he has a scheme in which you will detect particles using cavity resonance. So you have a cavity which has some, uh, you know, resonant frequency and then if there are particles in it, it will behave differently compared if there are no particles. So there the analysis becomes completely different. But there has been a series of papers trying to work out whether everything is consistent, etc., etc. This is as of last two years, okay, and uh, you can look that up. So, which means that this field is still alive and kicking and it is not a closed set. Fine. So, that is all I wanted to say about uh, this entire horizon thermality and detector. But I want to sum it up by pointing out a few things which we will use when we are going to talk about the emergent gravity paradigm in the last lecture or tomorrow's lecture or whatever. So, the point is that everything which I have said has a local extension, okay. So, uh, the reason it works I will explain to you in a minute, but what is happening is the following. So, you think of T and X in some arbitrary coordinates. So, if you shine a torch beam here, the light rays are going along, the null rays are going along some crazy trajectory, light cones are not 45 degrees. Now, around this region you can go to a locally inertial frame. So, there is a freely falling frame and in that freely falling frame the light rays are going to be 45 degrees. But the freely falling frame exists only in some region and the sort of distance of the region is decided by the background curvature scale. So the curvatures have uh, dimensions 1 by L square, so you can go up to that distance L and within that distance the inertial frame exists. Now what is more important that the in a freely falling frame you can use validity of the uh, laws of special relativity. Remember in the very first day when I wanted to tell you how gravity is affecting the clock, this is what we did. We took a freely falling clock and said that freely falling clocks do not care about gravity and you can use special relativity there. So you can use that and this immediately tells you, once you write it down and you bring in general covariance, it tells you how gravity affects matter. So you can, you can use this in this local region. Now you take another observer. Who is a Rindler like observer here? So you have, what you have done is that you have taken an arbitrary curved space time, gone to an event and you have gone to a freely falling frame in that event. So you make a coordinate transformation and you will find up to some order in length, it is going to be eta mu nu. 
Then you will have corrections which depends on curvature multiplied by two factors of the coordinates because curvature has 1 by L square which will get neutralized by two factors of coordinates and that is this boundary. So, inside that you have a locally inertial frame, I can boost it, I can boost it with a given acceleration. So, if I have an acceleration you will have a Rindler trajectory here and I can introduce a Rindler frame. So, this is a local Rindler frame, outside this region these coordinate transformations will be very complicated. But inside this region you are going to have exactly the Rindler physics coming up. Now, what is interesting is that I can make this acceleration sufficiently large that this curve is very, very close to the horizon and close to the horizon I am safe in the sense that I am just doing local physics there. This whole thing translates, I mean the, our results translate into the following statement. In an arbitrary curved space frame, if you go near an arbitrary event, if you look at the vacuum fluctuations as seen by this guy and the easiest way to think about this is to go back to that TDLE kind of a derivation. So, you have a vacuum state and that is going to appear as a thermal state to the other guy. It is going to appear as thermal fluctuation here for this observer. Now, this is an extremely non-trivial equivalence and the fact that it works is telling us something very deep about gravity and that is what we will be trying to extract later on. And this is a very general result. And yesterday there was some discussion which was going on where I pointed out that it is not a very good idea to think of this as the temperature of the scalar field. So, we derived it by doing a scalar field in a collapsing metric. So, it is not that the scalar field has a temperature because this temperature does not know anything about the parameters of the scalar field. You can put a lambda phi 4 theory, you can put an m square, it is completely independent of all that. Tomorrow you come and put a vector field, it will have the same temperature. So, it is like I mean you have an oven at some temperature T, you put a cup of coffee it will achieve that temperature, you can put a cup of tea it will have that temperature. Of course, later on you can say the coffee has that temperature, but the temperature was more primordial, it was there in the oven. So, it is much nicer to think of it as the temperature of the space time as perceived by certain class of observers or entropy of the space time as attributed by certain class of observers. And that is vindicated by this kind of a picture. In any space time you go to a local event and you can do this. Now, this is very, very clear when you do it in the Euclidean sector. So, you have a local inertial frame, then you have a local Rundler frame and then you go Euclideanization there. The Euclideanization again will go for a toss far away, but we do not care. You can even change the coordinate transformation outside that region. But inside you match with your Rindler transformation which we have been working out all these days. Then what will happen in the Euclidean frame is that your hyperbola which is the trajectory of this guy <coughs> is going to become a circuit. So, I told you in a very uh, in another lecture that this has a natural time scale. Suppose your acceleration is actually mildly time dependent then you have a quantity kappa dot divided by kappa square which you can verify is a dimensionless quantity. If this quantity is less than 1, I mean far less than 1 or to some accuracy it is less than 1 say some epsilon where epsilon is the accuracy with which you want to do that, you can treat it as a constant acceleration case that is the k dot kappa dot is irrelevant. Here what is and uh, the reason I told you this comes about is that when you when you look at in the top frame there is there is two timelines of the Rindler. This is actual Minkowski where if I take this and if I take this curve this was done in a previous lecture there is this is a minus pi and plus pi kind of a thing. So, between these what happens? maps into the full circle in the Euclidean plane and our field theories are all defined in the Euclidean plane and we could get everything out of that. So, as long as nothing changes in this time scale, so which is a natural time scale, that is how you get kappa dot upon kappa gives you a time scale and 1 by kappa gives you another time scale and that is what you are comparing when you are taking kappa dot divided by kappa square. As long as that is small, everything which I have described is valid even in an arbitrary curved space. So, this circle I can make it go closer and closer to the uh, origin. Recall that I am again using a local Lorentz frame 
and translate it into the local Euclidean frame. And so there is a distance at which you are going to have the limitation that this is where the validity of the local inertial frame is going to come. So I am going to shrink this thing very, very small. I am going to just take quietly to this region where it is safe. So if I am doing that, then I am just sampling this point. What is that point translates into? That point translates into these light cones. So if I am very close to the light cone, then I can use the Rindler approximation. This is something which you have seen at several cases. And in time scale, it only has to go around once. Then I am picking up whatever I want in periodicity, etc. If I use this TD Lee argument, then with one rotation, I can uh, introduce this uh, relationship between the two vacuum states. So you have a local version. Of, oh, this is the picture which I was struggling to draw there, which I have shown you and I have put it back here. So if you take kappa t is minus pi and kappa t is plus pi, between these two, this uh, reddish colored region is what fills this region in, this, uh, in the Euclidean plane. So by the time you go from here to here, you have made one full circle. And if you go further, you are just going round and round in the same circle. And that is what cosine does for you compared to cosine. I mean, we discussed it in one of the lectures. There is one more point which I want to stress here, which will again come back. Uh, it will play an important role when I talk about the emergent gravity paradigm is that we mentioned several times that the light cones here are going to collapse into this center point. This also means that there is some interesting thing which happens to the normal of the surfaces. So let me explain that. What I have done here is this is Minkowskian and this is the light cone. Okay, so it's slightly bad drawing from mathematics. So this is the forward light cone, this is the backward light cone originating from this point and I have these uh, hyperbolas which I am rotating around. Okay? So this, this structure which you see is the rotation of the hyperbolas. So I can put any hyperbola in that, that will be an accelerated trajectory. So there are various hyperbolas and it is completely rotated about this axis. Now this hyperbola has a perfect normal, I mean this is in space time. So you have a surface and you can uh, draw its normal. So I have sort of figuratively drawn this normal. Let us now translate this into Euclidean sector. In the Euclidean sector, there is no light cone. The light cone is sitting in this point. And this hyperbolic surface which I have drawn in the circle is this x square you should think in terms of r square. So that is going to become a sphere. It is a circular uh, spherical object which has a normal. This normal will translate into this normal. Now suppose I am going to take this hyperbola, go closer and closer and closer to this light cone. When I do that, this normal will become normal to this null surface. Now this normal to the null surfaces have various peculiar features in the sense that it is both tangent and normal because a vector, two vectors you will say is orthogonal if VA, VA, UA is equal to 0. Now, if you have a null vector, LA, LA is equal to 0 all the time. So, L is orthogonal to itself. And if you define a null surface as the one whose normal, given a surface, take its derivative and you have a normal, and that normal is null, then the normal is also tangential. It is also sitting on that surface. So, you get a crazy kind of a normal, but you still get a normal on this light cone. Here, when I shrink it to the point, it is like taking a sphere, drawing its normal and shrinking the sphere to a origin. Then the normal can be anywhere. So the normal becomes ill-defined. So there is a normal hanging around all the time. This is going to play a role as a relic from the microstructure as a degree of freedom in, uh, in the quantum space time. So I just wanted to make this correspondence to you at this stage. Okay? So this is all I want. I think this is the last slide. So this is all I wanted to talk about as far as the uh, horizon thermality is concerned. I have still probably 15 minutes, so let me start on the next topic and then we will disperse. Okay. Now I want to completely change tack. Originally, I thought that I will discuss uh, time-dependent particle production in a, in a cosmological space-time and Schwinger effect, but I am off by something like one lecture, one lecture, one and a half lecture, so I am just scratching that. 
and I will discuss something more important uh, namely the cosmological constant problem and after the cosmological constant problem I will try to describe the emergent gravity uh, paradigm. So, we will probably be you know, may not need the full time on the last lecture, but we will see, but there is no time for me to discuss an entire new topic. So, this is how we will proceed. Okay. So, the yeah. Right. No, no, no. This has no connection with something moving in that. See, this is this is just the two time scales which I am comparing. Kappa dot upon kappa inverse is giving me one time scale. That is the time scale at which kappa is changing. Then kappa itself gives me a time scale, and these two time scales I am comparing. Then it will be h dot upon h square. No, that is all right. It is the slow roll parameter when there is a potential which is doing this. But I could have taken a, I do not need an inflationary picture at all. I can just take a radiation dominated case which is going over into a cosmological constant. So, this is a much more general comment. So, of course, in some specific cases these two things will match, but digital universe is what we are living today and we can ask whether the temperature is changing slowly or fast or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So, the first thing which I want to talk to you about is the so called cosmological constant problem and there my viewpoint is very nicely summarized by this quote. Um, I do not know whether you guys at this generation read Chesterton, I mean or I say dead with my generation. Does anyone know this author or this book? Ah, there is one person, okay, I am happy. Okay, if you have not read it, you should go and read it. It is a beautiful, it is a detective fiction, okay. So, where Father Brown comes up as a detective. And then um, this is a nice quote in that and uh, this is I think summarizes the cosmological constant problem and what people are doing about it. So, the main point I want to drive home to you is that the whole thing comes about because gravity makes breaks a symmetry which it should not be doing okay. and symmetries are sacred things and it should not be breaking and gravity is supposed to be a very beautiful theory, very nice theory etcetera it should not go around breaking symmetries, but it does and that is the way to view it. So, in order to do that, let us start with a matter Lagrangian in flat space time in inertial coordinates. So, there is an L matter d 4 x is a integration over d t and d 3 x and I am using inertial coordinate system. These are matter variable, this could be a scalar field, this could be derivatives of the scalar field etcetera, etcetera. Now, if I add a constant to this matter Lagrangian, I am just changing this L m to L m minus rho, where rho is a constant. This is a symmetry of the theory. You do not think of it as a symmetry of the theory, but it is a symmetry of the theory. This is a change in the Lagrangian, which does not change the equations of motion. I mean, if I change the Lagrangian in a particular way and the equations of motion does not change, would not you call it a symmetry? This is exactly what it is. This is a symmetry, somewhat trivial symmetry, but it is a symmetry of the theory. Now, you do the same thing in, in a curved space time or in a curvilinear coordinate, but you say that there is no dynamics in gravity. Okay. You could have gone to a curvilinear coordinate, you could have done spherical polar coordinate, then this root minus g will be r square sin theta. So, it would not be 1. Or you can sit in a genuine curved space time and you have a d 4 x time root minus g and now the ordinary derivatives of the matter field will become covariant derivatives and you have q. You can do exactly the same. You start with this Lagrangian and you add a constant to this. Nothing happens. The equations of motion for matter field is still invariant and there is nothing to worry about. You, this is still a symmetry even in a curved space time. The problem arises when gravity becomes dynamical. So, what you do is that you have this matter Lagrangian and then you add to it this. This is why I say gravity breaks a symmetry. The matter was nice and innocent and you could have added a constant to it, but the moment you add this, the standard idea is that the metric is a dynamical variable, it is like a field and I vary the metric to get the equations of motion for that with uh, this matters variation with respect to the metric giving me the energy momentum tensor. So, if you take that point of view, then if I add a constant here, you are in trouble. Because originally you had an equation of motion with this L m you got a T a b energy momentum tensor and this gave you some G a b. So, you capital G a b equals to T a b is your Einstein's equation. 
Now you go and add a constant to this, this rho goes and couples to root minus g. It even did in curvilinear coordinates or in curved space time, but as long as you do not vary root minus g, there is no problem. But the moment you vary root minus g, your equations of motion is going to pick up a contribution type for rho root minus g. So, you will get an energy momentum tensor out of that. And in fact, you can convince yourself that this energy momentum tensor will be proportional to Kronecker delta. Okay? So, you will pick up an energy momentum tensor there and the equations of motion changes. So, the gravitational equations of motion breaks a symmetry which is present in the matter equations of motion. Matter equations of motion are invariant under this addition. Even in this particular action, if you vary matter variables, you are going to get back the same original equations of motion as though rho is not there. But if you vary the metric, you are going to get a new equations of motion. This is bad and this is the root cause of the cosmological constant problem that the gravity does not respect a uh, symmetry which is respected by every other system we know that addition of a constant to a Lagrangian does not change the equation of motion. Addition of a constant to a Lagrangian changes the equation of motion for gravity. So, once you have got this, you could have flipped that row and put it here. There is only the total action which matters. So, instead of putting the row there, you put the row there. And nor what people conventionally do is to write that row as some 2 lambda with a 16 pi g taken out because here I just kept 16 pi g here and row here. So, this is the conventional way in which people write the thing. I mean this is in case some of you are seeing it for the first time. R has dimensions of 1 by length square. So, this lambda also has dimensions of 1 by length square. Now, the question is what is this lambda? So, you have added some constant to L matter and what is this lambda? Now, the problem with this, the standard description, this one really kicks in only at cosmological scale. So, I have to introduce a little bit of cosmology for you. So, we will do the smooth cosmology that is we are going to ignore all the structures and all that and we are going to average out the density. Then the universe to a great extent is described by a metric like this, which is minus dt square and an expansion factor a square of t. And this is like dr square, but I would like to reserve that r for proper coordinates, assuming I am going to be consistent. So, this x is the coordinate distance and then there is another x square into d omega square. d omega square is d theta square plus sin square theta d phi square. So, this is the metric and uh, those of you who know a little bit of cosmology will know that you could have put a 1 minus k x square here and I am taking that k to be 0 which is same as saying that if I take a t is equal to constant slice, t is equal to constant, so this is a constant and this is just dr square plus r square times d omega square, so that is flat. So, the spatial sections of the universe are flat. Of course, the space time is not flat, but the spatial sections are flat. To a great extent, we know from observation that this is true, so this is what we will work with. Then the energy momentum tensor for the matter has a particular form that is this T A B has to finally be equated to a G A B and the form of the G A B is dictated by the metric which you have written down here. Now, the obvious symmetries of the metric is that it is invariant under translation. So, it is homogeneous x going to x y z going into some uh, addition is uh, fine because it, the cross sections are flat space times. It is also isotropic, you can rotate the coordinates. So, this determines what is the form of GAB is and if you are going to equate it to TAB, it has a very definite structure and it is determined by two functions, one called rho which people normally think of as energy density, another called P which people normally think of as pressure. These are just names. Okay? Do not think that pressure is the pressure which you have in your cycle tire and energy density is some energy density. It is just names. You write down TAB in a particular form and if you had an ideal fluid, nice realistic thing with a realistic energy density and a pressure, then you know energy momentum tensor, it will match. So, if your space time is populated by an ideal fluid, then this P will be the pressure of the ideal fluid and rho will be the energy density of the ideal fluid. In general, these are just functions which are there in the TAB. 
which you have to specify before you can solve for uh, your GAP. So, there is a result in general relativity that this quantity has a covariant divergence which is 0, which means that this should have a 0 covariant divergence and if you write that down, you get this equation. So, this is a nice mnemonic, it looks like you take energy and you think of this as some volume and this rho v is the total energy inside, change in that total energy is as though this pressure times dv, this is like minus p dv. Again, that is only a mnemonic, but this equation is correct, okay. So, this is one equation. Now, suppose somebody gives you what kind of matter is present. In order to tell you what kind of matter is present, he should tell you what is rho as a function of p or what is p as a function of rho, he should give the relation between these two. So, then you can tuck in this uh, p as a function of rho and you can integrate this equation. So, you can immediately get what is the energy density and therefore, what is the pressure for these symbols. I will keep calling it energy density and pressure, but remember the disclaimer. So, you can compute this and then you know what these quantities are. Then you need that is what I have written down here. So, p is equal to p of a allows you to integrate and find rho as a function of rho of a. This is, you can also do the same thing by going and writing this equation between TAB and GAB. You will find that there are only two independent equations. One equation tells you that A dot upon A the whole square is sourced by rho and this A double dot upon A is sourced by rho plus 3p with a minus sign here. This minus sign is going to become very, very crucial. Here, if you, if you manipulate these two equations, you will get back this equation. It is fairly straightforward. I mean, it is a standard exercise in cosmology. So, out of these three, only two equations are independent. So, the easiest procedure is to take this, use this, get this. So, you know rho as a function of a, plug it in here and integrate this and you know a as a function of t. This is what we will be doing most of the time. So, if you do that, you can compare it with observations. So, here is a picture of what I would call the phase space of the universe. This is the rate at which the universe is expanding, essentially a dot with some dimensional parameter thrown in. This is a. So, if you think of a as a coordinate, a dot as velocity and this is the phase space of the universe. And you can measure these things using observations like supernova observations which are used here. And this is in fact an old picture, I mean, but nothing much has changed. So, you can, you can fit a curve to it and the curve goes like this. And you do not have to do enormous amount of data to show that it is coming down and then going up. So, the velocity is decreasing which means the universe has been decelerating and at some time it turned around and A is normalized to unity today. So, at some stage it turned around and then it is accelerating, okay. This is something which all of you would have heard. I mean, it is a much hyped up about result. Now, the simplest way to get this is that you take whatever rho and p you have, you know normal matter, uh, radiation, etcetera, but add to it a cosmological constant. So, the cosmological constant contributes an energy momentum tensor, which you can work out by varying the uh, a constant into root minus g in the action principle. It will contribute an energy momentum tensor T a b, which is proportional to delta a b. Okay. So, this is if you look at it in a diagonal form, for an ideal fluid you will have rho minus p minus p minus p in the diagonal form and here everything is 1, 1, 1, it is proportional to that which means p should be equal to minus rho which is the equation of state for this system. So, in the that is what I have written down here, the energy density contributed by the cosmological constant is minus the pressure contributed by the cosmological constant, which is this given by this lambda upon 8 pi g, where lambda is the cosmological constant. Now, this is why I said when I call it pressure, do not think of it air in your cycle tire, because this pressure has to be negative or energy density has to be negative. If energy density is negative in a k is equal to 0 model, you are in deep trouble, because if this goes negative, your A will become complex, we do not want that. So, we will keep energy density to be positive and you will take this pressure to be negative. So, you get this equation and what is important here is that have I got a slide on that? Uh, no, okay. So, let us go back to this. You look at this term, 
this time is for normal matter but if you look at the look at this combination and you take rho plus 3 p you immediately find that that is negative because p is equal to minus rho this is 3, 3 minus 3 rho will dominate over rho so it becomes negative and this minus sign plus that negative makes it plus so your a double dot is positive which is what you want so if a universe is dominated by cosmological constant it will accelerate of course, there are other cases in which the acceleration can come about, I mean, but something weird has to happen. For normal matter, if rho and p are positive semi-definite, then this term is, uh, forget this, and suppose you have just rho and uh, p, and both of them are positive semi-definite, then this quantity with a minus n is negative, so a double dot has to be negative, which means it has to be decelerating. So, in order to accelerate the universe, you need something exotic, and the simplest object which you can throw in is this cosmological constant. So, what it tells you is that the observations require this lambda to be minus uh, 10 to the minus 56 centimeter to the minus 2, okay. Because I, I told you that you can fit it and then there is a host of other observations, almost all of them are consistent with it, it is not going away. And the cosmological constant contributes an energy momentum tensor with a Tik which is which I have written down here rho lambda times this. The way to think about this is it has p plus rho equal to 0. I will show you later on that p plus rho is a nice quantity. Those of you who remember your thermodynamics will know that p plus rho happens to be for mu is equal to 0 system is capital T times entropy density, okay. This is a thermodynamic relation called gibbs duhem relation. So what it tells you is that cosmological constant has 0 entropy density. Do not confuse it with the thermal entropy of a DC horizon. This is just the cosmological constant in the bulk that is giving you zero energy, uh, heat density. That is T times as entropy density is zero, so its heat density is zero, fine. This entire addition of this rho lambda, as I told you right at the beginning, is equivalent to shift in the zero of the energy density. So, so that is a good place to stop and then we will take it up in the next lecture. Okay, thanks. Questions? shift in the zero. Oh, okay, so that was what we started with, right? I mean, if you take a Lagrangian and you just added a rho here, it will add to the Hamiltonian a rho. So, it is a shift in the zero level of the energy density. Yeah. Any other questions? Ah, okay. So this is for the detector response or something. Yeah, fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there is some external source or something. Correct. Okay. We have to be careful about the entire dynamics. So, let me make sure I understand the context. For example, I can switch on an electric field in a in a flat space time and the electric field will produce both uh, charged boson pairs and charged fermion pair. Is that happy? Are you happy with that situation? Okay, fine. So, these are being produced. Now, where is the observer coming in? So, you want an accelerator detector. Okay, then let us now do an electric field. So, I have a vacuum of the fermion field and a vacuum of the boson field and then there is an accelerated detector who is going there and the accelerated detector is coupled, let us say we have two detectors, one detector couples to the boson field, the other couples to the fermion field and both of them will click. In three dimensions, they will all click as you would expect. Yes. Well, in the vacuum state, no, because we are doing all this in the vacuum state. See, the whole point about this is that the detector is accelerating through the inertial vacuum. So, there are no real bosons or fermions or anyons in that, okay, but still it will click. 
This is the way it is, the vacuum of one guy appears to be filled with particles for the other guy. This is how we started. And then they thought that detectors are going to give you a clean demonstration of that. And if you believe space is three dimensional, fine, there is, there is no problem. It does give you a clean demonstration of that. Because the accelerated detector he is going to see particles in what you thought was the vacuum. Now you go to the guy who thought it was a vacuum and you tell him that, look, my detector is clicking away to glory. And he will say, yeah, you are pushing it, you are supplying energy, you are exciting it, you are also emitting energy. I am finding that the field is ending up in an excited state. Absolutely. What can I talk about nothing, nothing. So the beauty is that null surfaces has something called surface gravity, which you can just define in terms of the congruence of null generator. It's a purely geometric concept. And then if you do a quantum field theory in that local region, by the, the cleanest thing is again that propagator method, which I told you, you just let it cross uh, two points. Then you will find that it picks up by e to the minus beta e factor where this beta comes from the surface gravity which is a, which you thought was a purely geometrical quantity. So that geometrical quantity appears as though it is, uh, it is a temperature. That is why I think this is a nice way to do that. I forgot to emphasize it in yesterday's derivation. In yesterday's derivation when you have a nice collapsing shell, where did kappa come from? Unfortunately, I, I missed it. I, I should have spent a moment on that. What happened was that you had this differential equation. And you had a small u going as logarithm of capital U. Just one step before I was integrating that equation. And I was integrating that equation near c is equal to 0. Remember c was the coefficient which was hitting the metric. So we had a system. It's good you brought it up. I should have said it yesterday. d square had a minus c and a du dv, lower case. And c is like 1 minus 2m by r. So when you did all the calculations, you wrote down differential equations and you are integrating to find this u as a function of capital U and all that. You needed to work near c is equal to 0. Then I said that near c is equal to 0, it is going to be 0 plus dc by dr into some r minus rh. Okay, I didn't do it in this detail, but it is there in the slides. So dc by dr is a purely geometrical quantity coming from the metric. This is what we wrote as some half kappa, and that is where the surface gravity came up. And then you found that the temperature is given by that kappa. Okay? So it is inheriting it from the geometry. So I think that is the proper way to think about it. Anything else? Right. Okay, so that depends on at level of at what level of sophistication one want to talk about it. If you can actually introduce a measure on which has not been done to my satisfaction, but if you can actually introduce a measure to count uh, what is the space of all gauge modes when a horizon is present and when a horizon is not present. Then if you count how many extra degrees of freedom is coming, of course it will be infinite, but if you regularize it properly, you should be able to get the entropy of the horizon from it, the entropy density, which will essentially be 1 by 4, because if you count entropy per unit area, it will be a pure number. There are some indications, and that is what I, I didn't give you reference, but it is a paper by Vibhas Maji and me, where uh, we have used some argument to say that this is going to happen. But uh, it, it is not a rigorous proof because I don't know how to introduce this measure properly and do this calculation. Anything else? Yeah. The unroot temperature? Yes, okay. There is, there is every once in a while there is in literature there are ideas as to how it can be measured and um, Kinjal is trying something along those lines and you can talk to him. There is, there is some experimental setup in which he believes it is probably accessible, but it has not been measured. 
what is the closest which has been done is there are some things called analog gravity. What it means is that you take a fluid and then you write down perturbations in the fluid and the perturbations in the fluid satisfies an equation which is almost like line coordinate equation. And then you can sort of do some approximation and then you can have some kind of an you know the analog of uh, either black hole radiation or an undrew radiation in these contexts and people have tried to measure that and there are yes and there are conflicting claims as to whether it is measured or not measured. I have heard seminars on this but I have not been keeping tabs on it very actively but Kinjal is the guy. He is going away tomorrow so you should talk to him. But uh, at some level I would not be surprised because the theory behind it seems to be very concrete. So, but it would still be nice to measure it, yeah. 